Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Cosplay Crunch. Each week, we sit down to talk about all things cosplay, including personal experiences, useful tips and advice, horror stories and hot takes, and sometimes the latest news and even drama. I am your host, Savage Cosplay, and this week on the podcast, we have none other than the infamous? No. Famous. No. How is the adjective, insert adjective here? Amazingly talented and phenomenal, the geeky seamstress, aka Mindy. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. When I was first thinking of who would be in these first few episodes and who would be on season one, you were immediately at the top of my list because Aww. not only have you done cosplay for so long and are you so experienced, but also we vibe and we have a lot to say <laughs> we do we do <laughs> i i think i think that you are genuinely one of the people that i can sit down with and talk for like literally limitless amounts of time <laughs> about everything honestly yeah i you know it, it surprised me that it took us like we've been circling the same like groups of people for so long so it kind of surprised me that it took us so long to actually like sit down and chat together because it was like, oh, we can just go on forever. I know. I know. I, I'm i actually kind of shocked, too. But I want to because, you know, we came to know each other in the past few years. I want to get into some of your background because I'm mm-hmm. genuinely just really curious. Um, So I have some questions here. We can always <laughs> deviate. We will deviate, I'm sure. But oh, yeah. first I have on here. How did you find cosplay? How did you even discover it? And when did you wear your first costume? So my cosplay story is a little odd. Um, I feel like I came to cosplay a lot later than several people do. So my cosplay story um, is a little bit weird. I got into cosplay a little later than most of the people that I know. So a lot of like my friends and such like got into it through an anime club in high school. I was I got into cosplay I think I was 23 at the time so kind of already senile no (laughs) oh my god it's okay it's okay it's okay I've called people worse no I mean I mean 23 honestly I feel like that's not the worst time to enter because not only are you in a more like um, mature space, but you also have a lot more means to resource things for yourself. Oh, absolutely. I never had to, um, I never had to watch my budget. The thing I way the way that I think I would have had to, if I had gone in as, you know, a a teenager. Mm -hmm. Um, so what had happened was I had finished my first master's degree and I had gotten a job out in East Texas. I was a librarian, um, out in a college in Tyler, Texas. And I had kind of felt like I was at this point where I was like, uh, okay, maybe I should like cool it on being so nerdy. Like I I should like start doing grown up stuff um and have more grown up interests. Like let me go, you know, investigate stocks and bonds and everything. Oh, the most <laughs> the most engaging and right, thrilling of anything. Right. So engaging. And so I had been at my new job for like a month or two. And one of the other librarians who was around my age came up to me one day and she was like, so we noticed during your interview that you minored in Japanese when you were uh, working on your undergrad. And I was like, yeah. So she was like, does that mean you're into anime? And I was it's, like, it's how moment. dare? How dare? <laughs> Clocked you. It's Clocked that me moment, immediately. It's that moment where you're in any professional environment and you think to yourself, like, what do I disclose? Like, how far do I go and what do I say? Essentially, like, I guess at the time you hadn't cosplayed yet, right? Mm-mm. But at, no. when, now as cosplayers, it's always like that. How do I explain this? Like, Absolutely. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, she had she had been like, okay, so, not to call you out, but also you're, like, the nerdiest person I've ever met, so have you ever been to a convention? And I was like, what's a convention? <laughs> and so she was like, listen, 
me and my friends from high school, we used to go to anime cons all the time. I really think you would enjoy this. We're going to go to a con together and we're going to cosplay together. And I was like, what's cosplay? So literally she threw me in front of her super shitty sewing machine. She, she said it was shitty. Like I wasn't the one who was saying it was shitty. She was the one who was like, listen, this is kind of a shitty number, but let's go for it. Um, so we spent probably three months uh, binge watching My Little Pony and uh, all sorts of anime. And she was just like, all right, let's go. Let's do this cosplay thing. So Akon in 2012 was my very first convention and my first time cosplaying. At that con, I cosplayed um, Korra from Avatar, The Last Air, uh, not, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Korra the from Korra. The Legend of Korra. Yes. Korra from The Legend yes. of Korra. There we go. Um, oh, my God. My costume was so awful. It was <laughs> legitimately falling apart as we walked to the hotel. Wait, as you walked uh, to the hotel, at, for, like, at the beginning of the day or the end of the day? <laughs> beginning of the day it was that bad yes like i had n oh my god oh my god i just was like oh boy this is a hot mess and i also um had done a co closet cosplay of rainbow dash from my little pony we had a little my little pony girl uh -huh. and uh on the way to the convention um i definitely had uh some folks stop me and be like so where's the pride event and i was like yes i am wearing lots of rainbows wrong event okay cool <laughs> but it was very funny i was like oh wait no that that's not what's happening here but uh good to know all right that is so funny so you your first convention was a con in 2012 which is a pretty a con's a pretty big first convention to go yeah. to i think mm -hmm. right like my first convention was in 2013 so the year mm. after and it was oni con which is a much more oh, approachable yeah. level of like your first convention, although I guess when it's your first convention, everything is kind of overwhelming. You don't, you're like seeing rainbows and stars and you don't know what's happening. So I guess maybe it doesn't really matter in that respect. But Akon as a first convention just seems like a really big way to start. It absolutely was. And it was overwhelming. Uh, and yeah, stars in my eyes and rainbows and everything. But, but overwhelming in the best way because I was just sitting there just going, oh my gosh, there are people that are into the same thing as me. And I like, I can be here in this environment with my shitty falling apart costume and people are still super friendly and cool and just like, oh my God, I love Korra or hey, I love Rainbow Dash too. And it was just, it's one of those moments where you sit there and you're like, I have found my people and this is amazing. That's, yeah, no, I think everyone has that moment when they first start going to conventions. And that's why a lot of people keep going for, mm -hmm. you know, the rest of their lives. Or even if they stop cosplaying, they'll still be like involved in the convention scene in some way. So, you know, I get that. Um, so I want to talk about, you know, you talked about you know, starting on that shitty sewing machine. And that was the first time you ever sewed. Is that correct? It was. It was. I had no crafty experience prior to that so it was just all brand new to me so how did you learn to sew over the years starting from the core that was falling apart mm -hmm. to now where you're making literal professional theater quality costumes <laughs> literally like how did you how did i know it's like uh, it's always a journey but mm -hmm. can you talk about how you started to learn to sew and what were some of the pivotal points you can think of that kind of got you to where you are today with your level of ability in sewing yeah absolutely so uh, i always joke that being a librarian is honestly my best skill set whenever it comes to cosplay because like the thing that librarians do is we know how to look for information we know how to look um for tutorials for um just any source of learning materials that are out there. So that's honestly something that I've always been really proud of is when I don't know how to do a thing, I will go out and I will find the answer, whether it's through traditional like book media or what, you know, something that's available on the internet. So after that first convention, I immediately went out, bought my own super shitty first sewing machine. It lasted like barely a year, but you know what? It got me, <laughs> it got me through those initial costumes. And honestly, that's something that I always like to recommend to baby cosplayers if they're interested in learning how to sew. 
it's okay to go out and buy the hundred dollar sewing machine. You don't have to go buy like the super top of the line number just to get an idea of whether or not that's something that's going to hold your interest. Cause there's so many ways that you can cosplay and sewing is not the only way to cosplay. There's mm-hmm. so many different like ways that you can venture into this. Uh, hobby. Right. Um, so yeah, I went out and I bought my first sewing machine and immediately I turned to professor Google and I was like, all right, give me the lowdown. Let me learn how, um, to, to do all the sewing and all the things. So I dove pretty heavily into YouTube tutorials. I think what really helped me advance my skills super fast was I got into making my own clothes there for a couple of years. Interesting. So I think it was 2014. I actually, there's, there's this thing among home sewists where it's um, like a no buy challenge where you intentionally will set a year where you don't buy any new fashion you only make or alter your clothes so that was like a huge step up for me in terms of the quality of my garments because i was like if i'm making something that is made with the intention of wearing it every single day then my quality has to be better my right my seam allowances have to be finished i have to be able to wear this in a way that you know i can go out and be wearing it for like 12 hours a day I never heard of that challenge before. Mm-hmm. That makes so much sense, though. Because yeah. if you're going to be putting yourself in front of the world to judge you, basically, as we mm-hmm. all do with our costumes anyway, but, like, you know, with your clothes, where you're seeing the normies, right? The people out in normal life, or your boss, or your your friends that don't even, right, and they're seeing your clothes, you don't want to look like Raggedy Muffin. Right. And, like, it was that was when I really got into a whole bunch of like the little things that you can do to take any kind of garment from, you know, looking very obviously homemade to looking professional, uh, which is like pressing your seams, finishing those seam allowances, you know, and, and knowing what fabrics to choose, because that's also a really big, important thing whenever you're choosing garments to wear on a daily basis. Also, tailoring. Tailoring was something I really picked up during that time period. Um, because something that a lot of people don't really grasp is that whenever you choose a sewing pattern, they're going off of a preset body type. And most of us don't fit into that body type. Right. So learning how to actually manipulate patterns so it actually was flattering to me was a big step for me in my personal journey because I... Like a lot of people, I have a history of disordered eating and I have a really rocky relationship um, with my body throughout the years. But actually learning that, you know what, the numbers on a measuring tape and on the back of a pattern envelope are literally just numbers. Mm -hmm. And what you do with those numbers is really empowering at the end of the day. So you can take something that, um, like I had always struggled with buying clothes off the rack and when i realized oh i can actually turn this into something that makes me look hot and i feel good at it fuck yeah let's go um that was a super empowering moment for me and you know what um so you would say that the year you spent making your own garments and pushing yourself to learn as much as you could using your research skills that you had developed was that kind of when you saw an exponential growth in terms of your own personal sewing ability? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, there's always this idea of like the 10,000 hour rule where, you know, you put in 10,000 hours of work to gain mastery um, in a specific skill, which, you know, there's thoughts about that, but whatever. Um, I definitely put in my 10,000 hours, probably my first two or three years of cosplay. Um, And it's always funny whenever people are like, oh, how do I get as good as you and i'm like honey we're all on our own individual journeys my journey doesn't look like your journey and that's okay like we're all just like on this roller coaster of life together but really what it boils down to is practice and i just i love sewing sewing is like i've tried all sorts of different ways of cosplaying um but sewing is the one i just keep coming back to it's the thing that like i really look forward to doing at the end of a long work day i'm like ah yes i get to go home to my sewing machine yay 
You know what I would have said if someone said, you know, Zach, how do I get as good at sewing as the geeky seamstress? Honey, you can't. Just hang it up and leave. No. <laughs> Your your work is just very good, but <laughs> oh, no, you're right. You. It's, it's a matter of practice. It's a matter of, you know, trying, failing, trying new things, learning new techniques, learning how to sew that works for you because everyone's mm-hmm. different. Um, you, so you never had any professional training throughout your cosplay journey, I'll say. And I know that recently you've been taking classes and like getting a degree, right? Mm-hmm. But that you had already approached that pretty much after you'd become a master, like, you know, seamstress. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So I had just really um, spent a lot of time, like I said, deep diving into different materials. Um, probably my go to source of information beyond Professor Google was when I was doing a lot of that home sewing and learning how to make garments. Um, I am super, super into a couple of like indie pattern designers, partly because they actually make patterns that are for a broad range Mm -hmm. of bodies. Um, But also there's a couple of places like Seamwork and cashmere there we go that's that's the word i was looking for um that that really take beginner sewists from i've never touched a sewing pattern in my life to here's a beautiful garment that i made myself um Um, but yeah i did that for several years before i started working on um working on my master's degree my second master's degree. There we go. <laughs> I'm just an education the, junkie. The, I keep going back to school. They can't get me away. The more important master's degree, you know. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Listen, I there's a lot of things that I love about being a librarian, but also I am very much a crafty person at heart. And working in theater has honestly been life changing in all the best ways. Uh, So I came into working on my master's degree um, because of the pandemic. Um, I pretty early on um, when I was learning how to cosplay, I was like, I had started a blog um, because I was sitting there like, you know what? Um, This is this is my librarian thing to do. I love sharing information with people. And the easiest way for me to do that is to um, have a blog and um, share the tutorials that I'm using and also like patterns and resources. Um, Blogging was also way more popular whenever I first got into cosplay compared to now. Um, I still keep up with it, but, uh, you know, that that era i think has probably passed um but we'll see you know social media is a dumpster fire right well you know you know what actually um yaya han actually gave me advice uh, not to me specifically i was uh we were at an event together and she had a panel um Mm -hmm. and i think it was like bernina university was maybe it but she has a blog and she's maintained it since i guess i don't know the beginning of time (laughs) who knows but um she said social media platforms could come and go and if you want a good record list of all of your work in a portfolio and like just to have a timeline of your progress, a blog's a great idea. Um, mm-hmm. I know a lot of people don't because it is like, you know, it's a decent amount of work to start a blog and to maintain it. But for longevity's sake, having your own blog or website that's yours is inherently more secure than a social media like page. Well, and, uh, you know rabbit trail that we're going to run down for for just a minute like especially with the tiktok ban that's being discussed right now i know and like i i've seen several friends uh one of them being vicky bain that Mm -hmm. like for one reason or other their accounts just get dropped like what do you mean dropped like banned like banned yeah like for wigs (laughs) She doesn't know, to this day, she still doesn't know what happened to get her account banned, but she just, like, woke up one day, and her Instagram was gone, and so she was posting about it on uh, on Twitter, we don't know X, like, she doesn't exist, <laughs> <laughs> and so she was posting up about it on Twitter, and a bunch of bots responded to her account, and her Twitter got banned, so, like, she straight up had to, like, contact other um, 
other cosplayers um, to get advocate help. for her. Yeah, advocate for her, and she had to file a, a complaint with the attorney general of California to get her account reinstated. It was so wild. No it way. Was, was she journey. was she living in California? No, it's just that's where she had to file the complaint oh. since since they're based since Meta's based out of there. That's insane. Wait, it was wild. So yeah, like on the TikTok piece. That it's crazy because I, in all honesty, I think that I think that ByteDance is going to sell TikTok and it's going to comply with what the house is almost assuredly going to pass, which is if you don't sell TikTok to a U.S. company, it's banned in the U.S. And a third of the users of TikTok are in the U.S. So they're not going to just like, you know, let it go banned. So it's going to get mm-hmm. sold. I think everyone that has a TikTok account with their content is going to be fine. I never started TikTok and I don't have one to this day. I literally just use Reels and I look at Andrew's TikTok sometimes. Um, but it was it was almost self-preservation for me to not like just rot in bed and look at TikToks all day. So I was like, that's fine. But um, no, I mean, all that being said, social media is not permanent. You don't really own you don't really own your account. Like you you do in a sense that you might have the only login to the account and you might be the sole controller of the profile, but they can take it away from you at any moment. I'm sure it's part of the terms and conditions that's in it there. It is, it is. And and I think that's always something to keep in mind. Um, if a product is free, then you are actually the product. And that's always something people need to keep in mind. Very that. If a product yeah. is free, you are the product. Wow. So, so yeah, it's it's always something that I try to keep in the back of my head. Like, I usually will have kind of a disengaged approach from social media, which is probably why my numbers are not bigger than what they are. But I'm just kind of like, I have about this much tolerance for getting on social media on a given that day. Very. And I'm going to leave it at here, because if I go up to here, then my... My mood just immediately dips, and it's you know what? We're not about soul. that. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and you exactly. honestly, I feel like you are actually better at using social media than the average person in terms of the frequency in which you share your work and your art. Like it's it's pretty consistent, and I I think part of that is probably because of the business aspect that you had worked through, and I do want to talk about that. Yeah, so, absolutely. Segueing to all of the work you've done with your business, your small business, I'll say, and like Mm -hmm. your brand of patterns, like, I guess just, I want, can you just tell everyone about what that journey looked like for you and how you even started becoming like the like authority on Sailor Fuku's (laughs) because it's kind of crazy. And I think that most anyone that Googles, you know, Sailor Moon pattern or Sailor Fuku tutorial or anything like that will probably come up with something you've made. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah so that was definitely a journey by itself um I, so i've been a sailor moon junkie since i was but to we last the background um, so, over there oh yeah yeah <laughs> the background can you can you see my sailor moon over here <laughs> yes there's a lot of sailor moon happening over here um yeah so I got into Sailor Moon like way back in the 90s whenever we had the really shitty Deke dub uh, that was airing on Saturday mornings. And the VHS Uh, tapes. Oh my god, Mm -hmm. yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, So I'm going to derail a little bit more and just be like, my my family like loved them to pieces, but they were also super religious fundamentalists and thought that anime was the devil. And so I was not allowed to watch Pokemon or Sailor Moon or anything. So I just had to like creep right next to the TV at 6am on Saturday morning and turn it as low as I could hear it. Which which Sailor Scout specifically was Satan? Was it? It had to have been one of the. Oh, it was one of the all lezzes. of them. It was all of them. Oh, it, wasn't no, one he... of the, it wasn't one of the cousins. No, no, no. It wasn't <laughs> one of the cousins. Like I don't think my parents knew that. Like there was a gay couple. <laughs> uh, no, it was also Pikachu. Pikachu was evil. <laughs> That's why I love it so much. <laughs> right. Um. So fast forward, and as I'm um. As I'm, you know, going deeper into my cosplay journey, I think like my fourth year of cosplay or something, I finally decided to cosplay my OG girl, um, Sailor Jupiter, like love her. Um, She is by and far my favorite Sailor Scout. And so I did my initial 
Fuku with Catherine Zan's pattern. Um, Catherine Zan was also a really popular Sailor Moon cosplayer. Um, she kind of disappeared off the face of the earth a few years ago, and yeah. I hope everything's okay with her. Um, but she was um, one of the people who actually released a full line of Sailor Fuku patterns. So, and they were super, super helpful. Um, so after I made that first Fuku, um, I wound up coming across a local Sailor Moon cosplay group. Uh, I'm not going to name names here because the person who was in charge of the group was um, notoriously problematic. Liv. And uh, they, they, had, <laughs> um, they had applications to be a part of the group. So I put in my application because um, I was like, hey, you know, I love Sailor Moon. I've made a Sailor Fuku before. Um, you know, here's examples of my work. I, and, you know, I only, I know that the, si the style of Fuku that you use only goes up to this size. You know, I'm larger than that, but I'm an experienced seamstress and I can easily modify the pattern to work for me. Didn't hear anything back. Was this like a Facebook um, group or how did you apply? What was this? Uh, it was Instagram at the time. An Instagram I, group? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, like, it was like just a cosplay group and they advertised their stuff okay. through Instagram. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so one of my friends who was very new to cosplay at the time, Space Cadet Cosplay, um, she doesn't cosplay a whole lot, a lot right now because she is very much in mom life. Mm -hmm. Um, but she is super into Sailor Venus and, um, she got invited to be part of the group because she had commissioned a Sailor Venus costume and they saw her at a con. They were like, hey, come be part of our group. And so I was sitting there like, oh sad okay um fast forward a few months and um space cadet reaches out to me and she's like hey so they're having some trouble like actually assembling the costumes can you like come over here for a day and just like kind of give them the lowdown of like how you made your sailor jupiter and i was like eh, you know what okay sure fine whatevs um so i went over there and um kind of got roped into like making all the hip rolls and the shoulder no. rolls for those costumes how it many was... girls how many was it 10 oh my god why does Ten. it always happen it's always the classic like oh, always can the experienced one come over yeah. and you know just give us tips and then yeah. you get there and they're like all right here's the sewing machine here's the fabric here's the batting here's a glass of water and here's your chain to lock you to the desk exactly <laughs> exactly yeah um, so that group, um, eventually they were like, oh, like, well, all of our cast people are in place. Um, but if you want, you could be like Mistress Nine. And I was like, eh, okay. All right. Um, that group did go on to win, um, best in show at Acon that year. <gasps> Wait, what year was this? <laughs> it was like... Was it 2016 or 2017? I remember this. Wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. Can we go a little deeper? So, oh, yeah. T, so you, you made the, some of the parts of the costumes, mm -hmm. but you were not in the group with them. No. And you weren't credited or you didn't go to the contest with them. Uh, yep, pretty much. And they won Best in Show. Uh-huh. Live lives yeah. like oh my god yeah. wait, can we do that yeah. more often can we just go and oh wait we're we have a whole hot topic on that so we're gonna wait for that <laughs> but um okay so continue continue so you you had experience working and mm -hmm. making uh sailor fukus and also mm -hmm. parts of other people's sailor fukus yep. for them yep. um so i found out kind of like after the fact that i was specifically not included uh in the initial casting of the group because I am plus size. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Uh huh. So we have the we have the the sewing, uh -huh. and yeah. then we have uh the oh we didn't include you intentionally because you're plus size. We just wanted you to help make everything for us. Okay, gotcha, yep, gotcha. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so I was feeling real petty at this point, and also the the gal who was responsible for the worst of the BS for the group um, started showing her true colors. And as what often does in these situations, the group fell apart. <laughs> yeah, it was a mess. It was, it was a mess. Like 
like homegirl straight up stole some of the costumes that some of the other girls had been working on and paid materials for. It was a whole mess. It was a whole mess. Absolutely a mess. Um, so yeah, I was driven by anime and spite, and I was like, you know what? <laughs> I ain't gonna do this. I ain't gonna play this game. Uh, so I redrafted all of my all of the patterns so that I could actually wear them mm -hmm. because I was over this BS. Right. Uh, and I was like, you know what? This this girl straight up stole from other cosplayers and I ain't here for it. So I put together um, the initial run of my tutorial explicitly giving credit to the cosplayers that she stole from and insisted that it was like, oh, it's my original stuff. No, it's not, honey. No, it's not. Um, so I put together my initial tutorial um, in 2016. Yep, end of 2016 was when that came out. Um, and that was like the first run of, for me, of that style of fuku. Mm -hmm. um, and over the years, I just kept coming back to it and back to it because I had been making stuff for um, the friends that I still had from that original group. Um, I remade several of their costumes, especially the girls that had their costumes stolen. Right. Um, I I have I helped them remake their costumes, um, and I just kept coming back to that style of fuku. Um, and eventually, people started reaching out and going, "Can you make these for for me?" Um, and I had clients from everywhere, including international. Um, and I had a, the thing that really stuck out to me about making fukus for other people um, was especially my trans and my plus size clients who were mm -hmm. like, I've had so many people tell me that they just will not make things for me wow. because of my body. And um, you're helping me like make my childhood dream come true. And I was like, Fuck those other commissioners <laughs> for making you feel bad about yourself. Let's do this. Seriously. So was it was it hard commissioning and making custom fugus for all of these different people from around the world? Because not necessarily because they were plus size or because they were trans or whatever, but just because they aren't there with you to try on. Mm -hmm. Like, was that a challenge? And how did you navigate that? So it is absolutely a challenge to do sewing or any kind of commission, I would imagine, um, from a distance. The uh, So I had actually been doing commissions for people prior to specializing in fukus. I think I started doing commissions for people like 20. And really what I found was I started focusing specifically on the fukus because I got to a point where I was making so many of them. I I got a lot better at figuring out what adjustments I needed to make. Uh, the difficulty with doing just like any fabric commission is that, you know, especially when you're looking at fit of a costume, it's like, you know, something might sit weird. You might have a funky shoulder slope or these various adjustments that you need to make on your body. And when I was accepting just any fabric-based commission, I would have to like make mock-ups for people and mail them and have them take pictures and then be like, okay, um, you're actually not zipping your zipper all the way and that affects the fit of this costume. So if you could just like zip your costume all the way up, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I found that by specializing in fukus, um, especially the way that I currently do them, I could identify a lot of troubleshooting issues um, just based off of seeing their measurements. Um, so because fukus um, have a leotard um, that is very stretchy, there's a lot more leeway um, for fit compared okay. to, you know, working with just a woven, non-stretchy material. Right. That makes sense. So in a sense, the type of costume lended itself to being a good commission choice for you mm -hmm. in addition you had the expertise and the proven practices that you had you know developed or used other people's uh, resources and tutorials as like a building block for your own patterns so all that kind of came together in a way to where you were able to effectively and you know at a good level of quality make these commissions for people you had never met before yeah yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is where, you know, um, social media is uh, a flaming dumpster fire, but it's also an effective business tool because, like, 
I would say probably 90% of my business came word of mouth directly through Instagram. Really? Um, and it was really, uh, like you were mentioning earlier, um, usually what I'll do is, you know, every time there's a commission that I've just finished, I'll either post the work in progress or I'll post a reel or an image of the costume that, you know, I've been working on. So that's that's often uh, a lot of, uh, it, it's definitely a huge area a, a huge pool for for content creation there no I, I would imagine that as well and like you do have more when you have more like going on with works in progress photo shoots etc you have more to post and you have more to share so that makes sense mm -hmm. um back going piggybacking off of this one more step cosplay proportions in construction so mm -hmm. i know we have probably faced a similar path at some point where we see people buying costumes on aliexpress taobao wherever you want right and i don't know about today because quite frankly i haven't looked to buy a costume from one of those places in at least two years maybe but there was a time where i saw people buying pretty high quality cosplays from online stores usually coming from china and I thought, oh, this would be a really fun way to actually be in a group cosplay on something I don't necessarily want to make for myself. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily feel like my time is necessarily warranted to make this school uniform or whatever have you. And so I would say, let me go buy it and I'll match the group even. I'll be in the same like fabric and everything. And I'll go on the website and either there just won't exist measurements for me as a mm -hmm. large American man or um, they'll say they have measurements that fit and or they'll take custom measurements and you'll get the costume and it won't even fit over a thigh. So I all that prefaced, I know for me, that was part of my journey in making my own costumes. Um, how did that play in for you? And then along with that, proportionizing and making costumes that fit your body type. I want you to talk about that as well, because I also, I feel like it's a journey for me and I try to make costumes that fit me knowing I'm not like this stick thin twink of an anime man. So mm -hmm, like, how, mm -hmm. talk about that. Like, I guess the, the proportionizing in terms of uh, being a larger person and also, um, you know, the experience you've had with trying to find off the shelf cosplays. Um, so that was really what pushed me into making my own cosplays in the first place was, um, I was actually about 50 pounds lighter whenever I first started cosplay. <laughs> At that point in time, I was like exercising a stupid amount and I was still a large person. I'm five foot 10, have always been built like an Amazon. Um, I've got like very broad shoulders and like, I've just always been large. And so whenever I was first looking at cosplay, like I, I'd been warned off of buying cosplays um, from early from early cosplay friends because they several of them were plus size and they were like, you're, you're not going to find anything. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, OK, well, I won't even bother trying. Um, it's probably only been in the last like five, six years that I even tried to, <laughs> to look for, <laughs> for off the rack cosplays. Um, and I've come across a couple that are kind of okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it's usually been from like super popular series. Like I bought a, um, a bleach costume okay. um, to, and I just honestly, like what I often do being a very large um, woman is I will straight up buy men's clothes in the largest size that I can find and then tailor them down to me. Oh, uh, so if it's like, if it's like, um, how do I explain? Like a Naruto, like, um, what are those jackets called? You know what I'm talking about? Like, or like, if, oh, it's, like, if it's like a gender, like, uh, I don't know, like, if the costume fits both characters, you'll just buy right. the largest size in like a men's version and then take it yeah. down. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Because, like, usually if I see something in a women's size, I'm like, mm, yeah, that's, even if it does meet um, my body's, like, measurements, reality is that, again, I'm five foot ten, it's going to be too short. Like, right. there, there's this Mick Costumes um, version of, of Tennis Peach okay. that I desperately want because it's, like, 
thirty dollars, and I really don't want to make that dress. I just right. honestly don't. Well, you'll make it for like a hundred, right? And right. Like, yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> but it, but I sit there and like I read the reviews, and it's like, oh yeah, it's it's got it. It means my bust measurement. Oh, these this five foot three girl says that it's um too short for her. Well, that's gonna be a crop top on me, so <laughs> So it's like Good basically times. it's like a non starter basically. It's like what do you and in, in my experience I had one it was from free, like swim club. Mm-hmm. And we bought mm-hmm. these like matching sailor uniforms that were very cute, very gay. And we all ordered them up cor- according to our measurements it was like me and then two other friends um and the pants would not even fit over my butt and Mm -hmm. on Mm -hmm. them the tops wouldn't fit over their chest so none of us could wear the costumes and they were not big people they were like you know average size like five foot four like women so mm-hmm, it just mm-hmm. that was a case of the costumes just fit no one and the measurements were horrible yeah. and it was just a mess it wasn't necessarily just because of that but yeah i'm like i feel like buying costumes because of how unpredictable it is is a huge reason why i just don't even want to mess with it and you know i do know some plus size cosplayers that like have spent a lot of time like hunting down reliable shops and like power to them i just I hate the idea of spending 50 to a hundred dollars for something that may or may not fit. And in my experience usually doesn't fit. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's like, okay, if I'm going to spend that money, then why don't I actually put that money towards something that I know will fit. Um, oh, exactly. And that's, and that's not to say that I haven't had any luck with pre-purchase costumes. Like I, Surprisingly enough, the Mick costumes plus size version of um, the Witcher costumes, like that one was pretty solid, but I still had to put a lot of work into the costume to actually make it work for me. Gotcha. It was, yeah, so it was like, yeah, I spent $75 on it, but then I also had to turn around and put a lot of work into it so that it would, you know, fit well. Do you have any quick tips or advice for either? Uh, cosplayers that are buying costumes that are too small that end up too small or not fitting well in every area how to like adjust that or tips for when you're designing your own costume how to make it fit in a flattering way to your body like i know that's a whole panel in itself oh but, like, absolutely any, any, like, hot ta- like high level hot takes or like tips mm-hmm. that you can think of um, so funny enough, I actually have written um, a blog on this topic. Um, it, Slay. <laughs> it, uh, I have a, sm- a small series on my Patreon on this topic, um, and it is uh, a free uh, read as well. So that one, like, if you go to um, patreon.com slash Cosmic Coterie, um, that should be one of the free reads on there. Um, but a couple of tips just, like, from my personal experience. Um, if you've got, like, a really snug-fitting garment, adding some kind of lace-up closure um, is often a really good idea. So, like, um, for my for my Siri, not Siri, I didn't cosplay Siri. I cosplayed the other one. There we go. The other, the other woman. One. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> Serious Bobby. Um, so yeah, for my Trist costume, it had like a um the, there actually were some like elasticy um panels on the side, so it had a little bit of flexibility to it, but it was like the elastic was very weak and it was not powerful enough to contain my assets. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the first things I did was I replaced all the closures on that outfit because I knew they were not going to be strong enough to actually like keep everything in place. Um, which is something I always recommend for, Oh, I'm going to go on another rabbit trail for just a second. Sure. Take us. Um, so I was shooting, um, the Academy version of Mercedes from Fire Emblem Three Houses at Coptocon. I think it was like 2018 or so. Okay. Maybe 2019. Anyway. Um, but to make life a little bit easier for me, I used a button-up blouse that I had from a My Hero Academia costume. And this was a purchase costume. So I just repurposed it for my Mercedes costume because I was like, eh, you know, just a basic blouse. She wears a cardigan over it anyway, or a shawl over mm-hmm. it anyway. No big deal, whatever. Um, 
this is where I sit there and I'm like, please, please, please reinforce your buttons at any given opportunity because in the middle of my photo shoot, um, the button right at the apex of my bus um, gave up on life and just like shot Stop out of it. existence. And I'm just sitting there like, um, this just became a whole other type of photo shoot. Oh my uh, god! Oops. That's like so. When you say that's honestly iconic, Liv. I hope everyone in the atrium witnessed. <laughs> Side. Oh, Thank even you. better. So hard nips then. Um, so when you say reinforce buttons, you just mean like stitch over them a few mm-hmm. more times. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, so usually um th- well, if you can also go out and buy better buttons in the right size if, if you can swing it. Oh yeah, because this was um, a this was a, a like a bot like top. Yeah, it was like, a bot, okay. it was a bot one. So um the 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 buttons on those um they they usually are very low quality and tend to break very easily i've had definitely while i've been trying to restitch the buttons on them had them shatter in my hands and i'm like stop oh, it stop oh, it right now i know it can happen oh my god it's it's happened to me before on uh, replacing the buttons for a couple of them it just it was too funny um but yes whenever i say reinforce like take a needle and thread go over that button just a couple of times so that you make sure it's nice and sturdy um just because usually whenever they're putting together these costumes like this is where i'm very passionate about um about fast fashion practices um because people often think that whenever you just buy a costume it, oh it's all assembled by machine no there's like real human labor right, that right. goes into these costumes and usually under absolutely atrocious conditions right um like it it is essentially slave labor and they're doing this in like really dangerous hazardous conditions if um definitely look up fast fashion practices um it, it's very eye-opening in a way that's going to make you feel real gross inside but also ev- people need to be aware right. of it um so whenever we're getting these costumes yeah they're really cheap for us but it, they're also not going to be super high quality like even the most well-made ones are not going to be like the buttons and closures usually are not going to be good because they have very limited amounts of time to actually put these things together. So usually whenever um, I do have a um, purchase costume, replacing all the closures is number one on my priority list. Um, But going back to Tris, um, one of the things that I did to actually make that costume fit me a little bit better Um, was I opened up the center back seam of my vest and I actually added in a lace up like corset style closure Mm. in the back so that I had some flexibility um, back there because usually people aren't usually going to look at the back of your costume realistically so um, if you have the ability to do that that can be really cool Um, there are definitely places that sell lace up style trim like there's definitely one in um, Yaya Han's line that I've used before to to add some width to my costumes Um, or if that's not an option if you can find a piece of fabric either in a complimentary or um, just some some kind of color that is an accent for your costume so it looks like it's you know part of the whole right. thing um that can also be a really good way to add um some width to, to your costumes if you have the ability to buy large and take it in because that is significantly easier um but you know if you can if you need to you can definitely add panels to make a costume a bit larger for you no that's all good advice and i think that definitely Anyone who's looking into this topic, go to the resource. What was it one more time? Where can they find like your total write up? Yeah, it's patreon.com slash cosmic coterie. Perfect. Love, Love that cosmic coterie. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll be going through a name change soon, just <laughs> FYI. So, oh, do you have yeah. any ideas for what it'll be? Uh, yeah, it's probably going to be cosmic creations. Ooh, cute. Yeah. Similar enough where people get the idea, mm-hmm. but new for like a new start and everything. Yes, so, yes, absolutely. All right, so on the eve, not the eve of WeebCon, but, you know, it's coming up. It's coming up here in a few weeks. Uh, I wanted to talk about your thoughts on compensation for cosplayers. 
And I want to know because, you know, you and I have both guests multiple times. We've seen different kinds of contracts with different types of compensation, um, small cons, big cons, you know, different amounts of resources available. What is your, I guess, I guess I could just leave it at that and throw it to you because I'm sure you have lots to say, but mm-hmm. I guess high level, um, what is your overall thoughts on cosplayers as guests and what they should be you know entitled to as a part of them being at the convention working for the convention adding value and content to the show well i think it really um i mean you kind of summed it up just with your question there um oftentimes um and this practice has definitely changed over the year, but sometimes there's this idea at the executive level that um, that just exposure is enough for a cosplayer. And it's like, okay, the reality is whenever you invite a cosplay guest to an event, that person is working just as much if not more than your volunteers who are there on the floor. And I say this as someone who has been there as a volunteer and a director of a department, um, as well as a cosplay guest. Um, So whenever I'm there as a guest, um, usually as a guest, you are prejudging the cosplay contest. Right. Um, And usually that means that you are locked away in a cold room for several hours on or days Saturday, or, or days or days there have definitely been some cons where I'm it's like okay here's two or three days that you're actually prejudging for the for the event so you're usually locked away in a room where you are um getting to know the costumes um that the contestants are bringing in so we get up close we get on the floor we flip their seams we look at their closures their rigging their attachment methods and that is usually something that like those contestants are back to back to back right. all day long. So no breaks. Yeah. No <laughs> breaks, no breaks. Like the best organized ones I've been to, we've gotten a one hour lunch break. Nice. Um, but most of them uh, there's usually an understood bleed over time into whatever breaks we have. And right. so you're usually doing that all day long. And then if you're lucky, you'll have an hour or two break where you can go shove food in your face and uh, go get changed. And then you go and judge the contest itself, which can, depending on the contest and the number of entries, is usually going to be at least two or three hours. Right. So on a given Saturday where you're a cosplay guest, you're usually working for anywhere from eight to 12 hours solid. And then there's also the other commitments as well right because it's not Mm -hmm. just usually when you're at a convention sometimes they book you just to be a cosplay judge which is nice but sometimes most of the time your commitment goes outside of that right yeah usually you're going to be expected to do a couple of panels as well um most of the time i will negotiate like one panel per day i'm at like that I'm not judging, but I've definitely had a couple of conventions where it's like, hey, so you can bring four panels to this event and judge, right? And it's just like, can I sleep? Can I sleep? Literally. (laughs) Can I sleep? It's like, no, actually, our convention runs 24 (laughs) hours, and we expect you to have your panel at 3 in the morning, 7, noon, and then also at midnight. So usually you're going to run a couple of panels as well. Um, And sometimes on top of all that, um, you will have a booth um, and your booth is where you're expected to be um, during show floor hours, whenever you're not completing other obligations. And that's where you're expected to meet and greet and interact with any of the attendees of the con. Um, So like comic Palooza, where you and I guessed Mm -hmm. it together last year, um, I would say that I was down, that we were down there probably a minimum of six hours a day. Right. I think that 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 experience specifically, the only time I wasn't with you was when if we were at, or at a booth was if we were mm-hmm. doing, pan- doing panels that we weren't doing together, um, mm-hmm. sleeping, eating, yep. 
Um, uh-huh. And then I remember on the very first Friday, I took like an hour to go do a photo shoot outside in the park. Right. And that's it. right. And other than that, yeah, we, were, we were together in it. Yeah. <laughs> We were in it. We were we were absolutely in it. And that's not to say that it isn't a blast to do, because right. it honestly is so much fun. But but it's still work. So we're we're there just as much as the other invited guests, as as much as the actors who are there. Um and also our likenesses are being used for promotional materials as well. So it's like we're there, we're working, we're doing our contractual obligations, but also our images are being used for promotion. And oftentimes, whenever you're under contract with a con, you're also doing some type of social media posting for them as well to, you know, draw in more attendees. So um, most cons I've worked for, they'll be like, hey, we need you to do at least three uh, posts on your social media, letting people know that you'll be there or, um, Hey, go sign up for the cosplay contest or something along those lines. Um, so all that said, um, I always approach, um, being invited to a con as I need to not pay anything out of pocket right. ultimately That's for like the work my, that I'm doing. I think that that is also my minimum requirement. Mm-hmm. And cause I will be honest and say there are for me, there's always, there's a big value in being brought as a guest to conventions that you may not be able to attend otherwise without being mm-hmm. invited in terms of your, you know, your financial ability, your schedule, et cetera. Um, but for me, the bare minimum is like, will I not have to pay anything in order to go and work at a convention for a weekend? Because that's really what it comes down to. Absolutely. Because like, again, like something to keep in mind is like exposure doesn't pay my bills. No. and uh, it, it doesn't pay my bills. And, and I would say that like you're hard pressed to find many cosplayers at all where it, mm-hmm. cosplay is paying their bills in any way, shape or form. Exactly. Exactly. And like if you're someone who um, like works, a, you know, a nine to five job, usually that means using a PTO day. Um, or if you're someone who works like a service job, it's like that income that could be going to your bills. Right. So like, it, it, it's something that I sit here and I'm like, I love doing it and I love going to do it, but you need to have me at a net zero at a bare right. minimum. <laughs> if, if you can throw in a, a guest appearance my way, cool. Um, but sometimes I'm, I'm going to be really picky about the con because it's like, okay, what's going to be more important to me? Like my PTO day or going to this event. Right. And, and honestly, just a little bit of gratitude and, you know, just treating your cosplay guests at the same level as your regular guests can go a really long way. Like one of the best conventions that I guessed it at last year was Anime Detour. Oh my god, they just like treated us like legit celebrities. Where was that they one? Were just, Where like, was it? Um that one was in Minneapolis. Okay. It was phenomenal. Also, there was um a 24-hour cafe and drag bar across the street and it was amazing. Oh, honey. Amazing. Hook a sister 9 a.m. mimosas. My... See, 9 see, a.m. mimosas. See, you were like, oh well, this convention in uh, Minneapolis treated us really well. They were so good. And I was like, oh, that's very nice. And then you say <laughs> all day drag bar across the street. <laughs> honey, hook a sister up. I'm I am i am gonna be there. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna send you the coordinator's information <laughs> because honestly they're a delight. They're absolutely Oh my a god. Delight. I'll be I'll go and do a show with the dolls across the street. We can have a collab. Oh my god so good um oh my gosh but but yeah like just just treat us like we're you know you you don't have to like treat us like the 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 headliners but at the same time it's like you've asked us to be there and work for you like give us some communication just just give me some people that like keep me in the loop with stuff and and again Net zero is my bare minimum. Right. I I think that's great advice. And also something to consider too there is that when you're thinking about going to a convention, you're also a lot of times making new costumes. You are um, going to be putting up expenses for, you know, maybe promotional materials you're bringing or prints or what have you. And I think that paying or giving an appearance fee does help cover some of those other expenses that you're incurring to go, even if it's not hotel 
flight, mm -hmm. transportation, food, right? Um, and I think it also just shows goodwill towards the cosplay community in general, saying, hey, we value the work that you're bringing and, the, and like, the content you're bringing for our show and your expertise mm -hmm. and years of experience to make sure we have a good cosplay program track. Um, again, I don't think uh, an appearance fee is by any means, like, a requirement across the board because there are conventions that you know are smaller right and yeah. i think that they're they i think every convention should do the best they can to host cosplay guests with the means that they have and i think with that being said a bare minimum is ensuring that you have transportation food and lodging covered for the duration that you're there absolutely and um you know, speaking of the appearance fee, I think sometimes people look at that and go, oh, well, why am I going to, you know, fly this cosplayer across the country or across the state mm -hmm. and give them all these things? And then I also have to pay them a $200 appearance fee. Like something else that cosplayers need more often than not is a handler. Like being in cosplay all day long is physically draining. And we need someone who can just be like, are you putting food in your face? Are you taking care of your bodily needs? Um, like, there's so many cosplayers that have some type of, like, medical disability or something along those lines. And so oftentimes, my appearance fee goes towards making sure that my handler, who is also giving up their entire weekend to make it to this event, also has food. Right. Exactly. So it's like, it, it's not like it's going in my pocket. It's going to make sure that all of my needs for the convention are met. Right. Or have the handler in the contract or in the agreement be given the mm -hmm. exact same compensation in terms of lodging, transportation, hotel as you. They might share the room with you, right? That's yeah. like, it's, you know, pretty normal and expected if they're a handler. You should probably be close enough to them to like share a place to sleep. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, um, absolutely. But no, it's so, it's so valid because a lot of costumes you can't put on by yourself. No. You can't even no. wear and, the costume without someone helping you. And I think that's something that, um, especially again, I've run into this, um, like, especially now that I actually work for a couple of cons where sometimes I have to like go, go to the executives and be like, look, you have this cosplay guest. They're expected to be in cosplay for the majority of the day. We are putting our bodies under duress to be in these costumes. And again, we enjoy it mm -hmm. because we're all apparently masochists. Exactly. Literally that. <laughs> but, but like, there's something like when you're in a wig cap all day and you're in a costume that encumbers your ability to move and eat and use the bathroom like it is it is physically taxing on your body to actually be in a cosplay um so sometimes the executives don't understand it's like as a cosplay guest we're expected to be in a lot more physically strenuous conditions right. than some of your other guests than are. all of the other guests i would say yeah. i can't think yeah. of any others that would be put so, in like, the same places yeah, I've definitely worked a couple of cons where it's like, oh, we'll put you in a hotel that's like a block away. And it's like, honey, no. <laughs> honey, no, I need to be able to walk across the street. <laughs> it's not okay. Um, so I do want to, I, wa I literally have so many more topics, but I need to hold them because I want to make sure we have enough time for our guest Absolutely. question, which is oh a my great God. one, I'll have oh to boy. say. Um, so if you're interested you can submit questions to the podcast either through our Instagram or on our website or on our email. And all of that uh, will be shared at the end of the podcast. But um, here's the question for this episode. Hello, cosplay crunch and special guests, um, AKA you. I wanted to get your thoughts on sandbagging. Recently, mm. there have been some accusations and drama around cosplayers buying cosplays and modifying them for contests um <coughs> russia um and winning major awards with those costumes also sometimes cosplayers enter a costume multiple times into different contests and win over and over again is this okay does it depend on the contest and costume Please let me know as I am starting to compete, but I don't want to get in trouble or falsely accuse anyone. So, yeah, this is um, this is a heavy topic um, in the cosplay community. My 
general approach is read the rules of the contest. Like that is going to be your guiding light um, whenever it comes to the contest that you're trying to enter. Um, there are some contests that will be like, hey, we have some kind of walk-on category or a strut your stuff category where if you didn't make your um, your costume but you still want to just like show it off, cool that is there for you but if you are entering a craftsmanship based competition you need to make your costume like no ifs ands or buts about it sometimes newbie cosplayers can run into oh what what constitutes actually making your costume if you buy a costume that's not making your costume <laughs> even it's if, not even, even, i, I it, swiped the credit card i went to the store <laughs> even if you modify that costume don't enter it into a contest like and here's the thing like judges are brought on for a reason and we're there to bring credibility to the contest and one of the things that we can do is we can generally suss out uh, <laughs> when someone has purchased a costume versus made their own and that goes for items that you might buy from the thrift shop and then claim that you patterned them yourself T. Um, here's a question. Yes. What if what <laughs> if you bought your costume, but you commissioned the costume? So you didn't just buy it from a store or from a thrift shop. You commissioned mm -hmm. the costume and you asked the commissioner, can I go and wear this for a contest? Is that okay to enter in a contest in your opinion? So funny I also do have like a funny story on this topic because it's happened with one of my pieces. <laughs> <laughs> um, so some contests, not all contests, again, read the freaking rules. As someone who is a cosplay contest director, please read the rules. We will look much more charitably on you if you actually read the rules. Um, some contests will have a rule where it's like if you are someone who is very stage shy, um, but someone has commissioned you or you want someone else to model the outfit, that that's okay. Mm -hmm. But usually both the model and the commissioner have to be in the room at prejudging with the explicit understanding that, you know, the model is wearing the piece that the commissioner has made. Right. However, if you go out and commission someone's work and then enter that into a contest, Usually that's not going to work out for you <laughs> because you, as the person who's entering the contest, didn't actually make the work. Um, I don't know how like different virtual contests run, but again, this is one of those situations where it's like, if there is any doubt in your mind, email the cosplay contest coordinator. It's going to be a lot better if you have truthful honest communication instead of like oh hey tee hee like the commissioner totally said it's okay and then we find out in three months that the commissioner's like what the damn hell and like then, no that that ain't gonna fly and then that ain't all gonna fly. of asia breaks loose on twitter oh my god <laughs> yes like no no um i definitely had a situation where i actually sold one of my old sailor scout costumes and someone entered it into a contest without my knowledge and i was just like do they win oh well is that shade on you <laughs> She, she should have she, she should have been like um i don't know why you didn't give me an award this was made by an award-winning master class cosplayer but like i think she was trying to enter it for a prop but i was just like honey oh my god no, that's so no, funny so i always no. also hear that oh the contest doesn't specify like it doesn't say you can't endure a costume you've already won at a different mm -hmm. convention and mm -hmm. so my what i always say in that situation is always assume just a blanket if you've won an award don't bring it if you have a question email the director like you said mm -hmm. or the cosplay mm -hmm. coordinator whoever is emails on yep. there email and ask and say hey i won a judge's award at this convention can i enter it into this category at this convention mm -hmm. they will tell you yes or no um and i think that 
ultimately the convention determination is what matters the most now Mm -hmm. there will be cosplayers that have their own opinion on what you should or shouldn't do from an etiquette perspective based Mm -hmm. on who you are um i always say that you know that's up to everyone's own opinion i have my own opinions on it like my personal opinion is for me myself if i win an award of any caliber at a contest that costume is not coming with me to a new contest because it won Mm -hmm. and placed in some way it got recognized in some way um right and to be honest generally if your costume didn't win it could happen because one of two things either the competition was so stiff that there were just costumes that demonstrated more than what you had or maybe Mm -hmm. in general it's not a contest worthy piece and you should make something new that's my personal opinion about my own work um and I say, like, at the end of the day, the con sets the rules, ask them, because they're the ones that, you know, are residing over the contest. Yeah, yeah. And I, I tend to fall, I, I tend to agree with you on, on those statements. Like, the only, usually if one of my costumes has taken home an award, especially, especially a best in category or best in show or anything like that, that costume, that costume no longer competes. It doesn't matter how many modifications you do. It doesn't matter what else you do to it. Don't. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it's done. It served its purpose. You did a great job. Right. And and you got the award for it. Right. Good job. Kudos to you. Right. Um, but at that point, costume's done. Uh, and like you said, um, like... Uh oh my goodness, there we go. There are words. Um <laughs> okay, we're almost there. <laughs> we're almost there, we're almost there. Um, like I might be like, oh, okay, you know, if I got a judge as a cho- choice at, you know, this convention, I might take it to another con, but maybe. It's a big maybe. And at that you point. still ask. Yes, exactly. You still have to ask. Always disclose information because I am more likely to be charitable both as a judge and a contest coordinator if you've been upfront and honest with me. If I find out later that, you know, you were kind of like, oh, yeah, I totally, like, won an award at this other event and you didn't tell me, it's kind of like, what else are you not telling me? And the girls will find out. The the, the oh, cosplayers yeah. will find oh. out. They will find it. Cosplayers will salute. Oh yeah, for sure. Oh my gosh. Yeah, sometimes... they will find out stuff so fast. Oh yeah. And sometimes <laughs> it's a matter of like, oh, I won an award like years ago, and then or maybe like a year ago, and then I entered it at a contest, and like even then they can still go find it. Sometimes oh, yeah. it's as quick as I won a convention at this con on this part of the city and there's another con happening over there. So I'm going to drive across town and enter into a different category with the same con costume and win that too. No. Yeah. What, what, no, are the the... Odds, what are the odds that that person in that scenario would have contacted the other contest on the way over in the car saying highly, I... <laughs> highly unlikely, <laughs> highly just... unlikely. But yeah, I, I also to your other point where it's just like, usually if you don't place um, again, either the competition was really stiff mm-hmm. or, and again, this is something that people don't always want to hear is sometimes that piece just isn't a good contest entry. Right. And anything can be a contest entry. Like, if you put in the work for it and depending on the event that you show up for, but sometimes, you know, there's just something about the costume that just doesn't work out. And maybe you need to like remake some elements of it and that's okay. Like generally when people go into a contest, I'm like, if you go in expecting to win, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> you are. Yeah. That's so true. Like, 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 don't just don't do it. It's not a, it's not a you're good You're setting yourself up for a lot of heartache. Yes. It's, it's not. And it sets up a really toxic mindset as well. So it's just like, go in, chat with the other cosplayers, enjoy, like, bring your best to the table and have a great time. And if that's like all you walk away with is having a good time, then you've already won. Like, right. that is my general good. No, I think so too. But, but yeah. Um, whenever it comes to like re-entering costumes, like if you've won an award already, it's time to move on. And look, that was a practice where like remaking pieces of your costume and re-entering like was definitely a thing for a long time in the community or, and 
you know, outside of the U.S., apparently that is a thing you can do. Mm. Um, but here in the U.S. and specifically within Texas, like, it's very frowned upon to do that. Right. And I have... I have had to revoke someone's award for doing that before, and it is an ugly feeling. And don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to the other contestants. Um, and don't do that to the people in charge of the contest, because it's not fun. It's really not fun. And also, pro tip, if you want to sandbag, um, don't don't enter a contest with a panel of judges and then enter another contest with one of the same judges on that panel because they'll probably remember you they might remember you they will remember you also also just fyi like the judging community is pretty freaking small and uh i have definitely contacted other contest coordinators and been like hey so we've got this guy in our contest and i'm pretty sure he placed at this (laughs) other contest can you just verify that for me like it's happened more than once totally happen more than once oh man oh you know all we can do is keep trying to do better as a group yeah as a team it absolutely yes Um, yes. okay well we are officially over so i need to wrap this we as i said we could literally talk forever but we could (laughs) i'm gonna go ahead and wrap it um thank you for joining another episode of the cosplay crunch you and our audience listening if you'd like to ask a question to one of our guests please email us at cosplaycrunchpod at gmail.com you can also follow us on instagram at cosplay crunch podcast for the latest podcast news and announcements as well as on cosplaycrunch.com and on youtube at the cosplay crunch podcast do you have any parting words for our guest mindy the geeky seamstress and also where can we find you on social media um, you can find me across all the major social media platforms as the geeky seamstress. Um, it's it's a the because there's another geeky seamstress in Britain. Really? <laughs> yes, there Love, is. But you're the. So it's also, I am the, the geeky seamstress. seamstress. Uh, but yeah, I'm on all the major social media platforms. I do also have a website where I have a blog, um, thegeekyseamstress.com. Uh, so you can find me on any of those platforms. Uh, parting words, um, it's cosplay. Have fun with it. Um, try not to take yourself too seriously, but take your craft seriously. Uh, that's usually my go-to. Like, it's We're here to have a good time. Enjoy yourself uh, and just... Don't be afraid to try new things. And, oh, you know what? One more thing I'd be remiss if I didn't mention. On the last episode, um, if you go tune into that one as well, I asked Alan Coffey, a.k.a. Carol, who would they least want to compete against in a costume contest? And you were the first one that came up because, oh my God. because she said, if Mindy came in and said she was making a ball gown and I had already started my ball gown, I would literally pack up my bags rather roll my bags out that weren't even unpacked and leave because it would be no way and and to clarify it wasn't just a costume contest it was a three-day timed thrown into a workroom cosplay contest scenario <laughs> and she's like if the if miss the geeky scene just came in girl cut the lights close the curtain we're done here i'm going to the airport <laughs> anyway thank you for joining i hope you all had a good time listening and stay tuned next week for another episode goodbye the cosplay crunch podcast is hosted by zavage cosplay with post-production also by zavage cosplay original theme music by katie fairbanks logo and graphic design by owl and coffee